Chandra from UNSW, and we'll talk about revisiting Bayesian deep learning with advanced in MCMC. Okay, thank you, Kate. I'm very much honored to be uh, invited for this seminar. And uh, uh, today, as you said, my topic is about Bayesian uh, deep learning. And uh, this is uh, kind of summarizing the past few years of work that I have been uh, doing here at the University of Sydney and here at uh, UNSW. So uh, my journey in this uh, Bayesian uh, Bayesian inference and MCMC methods it began in 2017 when uh, I began a research fellowship uh, at the University of Sydney. Uh, and then thanks to Professor Sally Cripps, she introduced me to the area of Bayesian inference and MCMC methods. And then we did a lot of work in the area of uh, applying MCMC methods, parallel tempering MCMC and others to geoscience, uh, geoscientific models. And then uh, a part of the work was uh, on, this, on the side, I, since I come from the area of uh, neural networks and deep learning, then I was always interested to apply these methods in that area. So uh, what I found in the beginning that, uh, uh, that uh, application of Bayesian inference to deep learning methods were very challenging and uh, MCMC methods, uh, uh, the computational power, especially when we are uh, dealing with a very large number of parameters. And uh, as we know that in deep neural networks, we can have hundreds of thousands of parameters to, uh, to millions of parameters at times. So we can't just jump into deep uh, neural networks uh, with MCMC uh, without uh, looking at uh, advanced MCMC methods. And that's where parallel computing comes in and advanced uh, proposal schemes of MCMC. And, uh, and uh, in this sem seminar, I will just uh, provide the roadmap for the inception implementation of and the execution of precision deep learning methods that begin with simple neural networks. And that's the simple neural network stuff began in 2017 at the University of Sydney. And then uh, later at the UNSW, it, moved on to deep neural networks. Uh, and uh, I will also provide a short discussion on LSTM models and Bayesian transformers and So uh, basically uh, I will uh, go over these papers and two of them have been published. The first one was in 2019 in neurocomputing and uh, surrogate uh, assisted parallel tempering in 2020. Then uh, these two papers we just placed in the archive, which is uh, application of Bayesian uh, 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 MCMC methods for deep learning models. Uh, so uh, what is Bayesian inference? I think uh, this, the, both of these groups are well aware of it, uh, but uh, all, anybody there who does not know, it's a method uh, principal approach towards uncertainty quantification of unknown free or unknown parameters. And these free or unknown parameters are in uh, neural networks, which we are known as the weights. In deep learning models, there are millions of these parameters that are typically uh, the weights that are typically uh, uh, estimated or uh, optimized by a gradient descent methods such as stochastic gradient descent and Adam. So, um, um, and uh, the use of MCMC methods have been popular in several fields. Um, sorry, just, uh, just uh, could you please uh, switch off your... Uh, So um, MCMC methods have been popular in other fields at science, environmental sciences, uh, health and medicine, astronomy, and of course, machine learning. Uh, Bayesian inference is also implemented not just by MCMC, but also by variational inference methods. And they have been popular in deep learning, particularly in uh, variational autoencoders. 
And uh, there has been slow progress in the use of MCMC methods, as I said before, but recent progress in Hamiltonian MCMC and Langevin MCMC opens the road for future progress. Uh, and essentially these methods, they use uh, gradients and um, Langevin MCMC is what is the focus of uh, today's uh, seminar. In all my papers, uh, we are applying uh, Langevin MCMC, but Hamiltonian MCMC can be used as well. What is the major difference between them? Langevin uses a one-step gradient to develop the proposal distribution, whereas in Hamiltonian, the, the number of steps uh, can vary, can be more than one, steps, one step. And uh, basically, this is an overview of uh, how Bayes' theorem is implemented to kind of uh, use the likelihood uh, based on data and take into account data and prior knowledge to update uh, uh, or estimate uh, and sample from the posterior distri probability distribution. And uh, this is done by constructing a Markov chain and, and a finite number of steps so that the desired uh, distribution becomes its equilibrium distribution. And the guy behind uh, all this is uh, Thomas Bayes. The, and uh, uh, hence uh, it's called Bayesian uh, inference and essentially we see likelihood via probability and um, posterior probability in the evidence. And this uh, is known as a Bayes theorem. And uh, basically uh, just a overview of uh, how the prior is adjusted and uh, uh, it's taken into account and then we have a posterior distribution via our likelihood. So uh, all those are the basics of uh, Bayesian in inference and MCMC methods. If, uh, if uh, anybody listening uh, does not know about them, please read about them online. There are a number of videos on YouTube, uh, the Wikipedia pages about them and so on. And there are also causes and online courses on MCMC methods and Bayesian inference that you can do. Uh, moving on, uh, now what we see is uh, basically a, a feed forward neural network here for the problem of uh, multi-step ahead uh, time series prediction, right? Uh, and uh, essentially, how do we, uh, and this is a multi-step ahead time series prediction with which is based on a univariate time series. So we just have one, one uh, input, uh, oh, sorry, one signal. And uh, basically what you need to do is uh, determine how many hidden neurons are there. And based on the number of steps, then we have that number of output neurons and the number of input neurons is de defined by the window size that we wish to take. So basically these, these red dots here, you can see the inputs and these blue ones are dots, uh, circles are, going to the outputs, right? And essentially this, uh, you need to do a process uh, or reconstruction or, or windowing where you grab um, slide windows and uh, de develop your training data set and test data set. And essentially um, this kind of gives you an overview of the sliding window approach and that's based on Taken's theorem and it's kind of well known and uh, you have a time lag and a dimension. And in the previous uh, case, I said that the dimension, input dimension is five and time lag is assumed to be one here. Um, and uh, essentially you develop your training data set and your test data set. And uh, the equation there is basically summarizing this neural network where we have the weights from the input to the hidden uh, and uh, hidden to the output. And then we have uh, activation function, which can be a sigmoid function or the logistic uh, function or 10H, linear, ReLU and others. I note that uh, if you are using gradient descent, then when you compute the gradient, the transfer function at the, uh, is important and uh, if you change the gradients computer using sigmoid, uh, will uh, necessarily not uh, will not um, be the same for the linear, and uh, hence uh, you need to be careful. You cannot just uh, use the same algorithm and change uh, 
uh, use the same gradients and change the transfer function as you please. But uh, so that is uh, basically the standard approach uh, is uh, you take data, you take, uh, do some type of windowing in the time of time series, in the case of time series prediction, and then you um, uh, uh, train your model and you test your model, you report something like the RNFC or other measures of error. But uh, if we uh, transform this uh, into a Bayes Bayesian framework where we use the MCMC methods, we, we can use uh, something uh, 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 such as a random walk proposal distribution. And instead of using gradients, we can in very simple neural networks. So the, this neural network is a simple neural network. We can quite easily train this with uh, just a random walk because here, uh, there will be less than 100 parameters for univariate model. So a uh, random walk will be okay. Uh, so, uh, but to do that, we need to form a, uh, de develop a likelihood function, which uh, uh, needs to be based, uh, which needs to be actually a log likelihood and uh, based on the probability density function, as you can see here, which takes in the data and our goal is to estimate uh, the weights and uh, and um, based on uh, the priors and the priors for the weights are normal uh, follows a normal distribution and then we have uh, another parameter in this uh, signal it's a signal plus noise model and basically the noise is uh, the tau squared you can see and that is uh, the prior for that is a gamma distribution. So basically that uh, gives the model likelihood and the priors for the MCMC and you can just do a random walk distribution, uh, uh, run a random walk uh, uh, MCMC sampler and uh, train that neural network. Uh, in the case of pattern classification problems, when we have uh, uh, discrete outcomes, then uh, the Gaussian likelihood does not apply there. We need to use something that is more appropriate. And that is where you used a multinomial likelihood as you can see here. And uh, we need to know that uh, the, the outcomes are all modeled by a multinomial log, log function uh, for a pattern classification problem. It could be a binary classification or multi-class classification. And this is uh, also known as the softmax in the neural network uh, literature. So essentially, uh, that those are th that's the basic uh, background of these things. And uh, we basically need to adjust these uh, weights. We need to propose samples, and we had to accept or reject the samples based on uh, Metropolis Hastings uh, criteria. And uh, so that is uh, all good uh, and that's the standard approach and uh, in the 90s and the early two, uh, especially in the 1990s, uh, a lot of random, the, the Bayesian neural network literature used to use random walks. Uh, and then just recently in the last 10 years, we have, uh, we have uh, the, the field is all getting revamped. Uh, we have huge deep learning revolution. And basically the random walk proposal distribution doesn't really work that well when you have too large number of a neural network of weights when the parameters increase and we need something uh, smart. And the thing is that uh, smart uh, uh, gradients are typically seen as a smart or a heuristic approach that has worked well for deep neural networks. And it's about how can we implement or incorporate gradients in a proposal distribution. And Langevin gradient distribution essentially features a one-step gradient over a Gaussian noise. So essentially you, you, you take uh, your set of uh, parameters, your set of weights, and you compute the gradient and you add noise to it. And then you either accept or reject that proposal. And uh, we will see that uh, is here is a very simple uh, single chain Langevin gradient MCMC. Uh, essentially, it's a simple for loop where you accept or reject a proposal and uh, based uh, on the Metropolis Hastings condition. And uh, that proposal is uh, taking into account uh, gradients. Uh, so, and uh, 
we will go into the equation of how these gradients are computed next. And basically those gradients are uh, then uh, computed and then we add uh, uh, some noise to it. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, Um, sorry, uh, I think I mistakenly commented my slide, which shows how the gradients are computed. But um, I think uh, in the neural networks uh, literature, it is well well known how gradients are computed. And uh, in my in my paper here, you could refer to uh, the equations of how the gradients are computed. Um, so uh, just uh, moving on. Uh, here we are, uh, uh, if we consider parallel tempering MCMC, uh, which is basically these, uh, these uh, MCMC chains, kind of you can assume them as running in parallel, right? Running in parallel. So where the M for parallel in an ensemble of R replicas, where M is uh, uh, the ensemble, replica ensemble, uh, particular replica ensemble denotes the particular replica ensemble. And then we have uh, the theta, which is the weights and biases of the neural network. So here, what we can see is uh, uh, the Q, uh, the Q uh, distribution or the priors. And uh, what happens is uh, the major part in MCMC algorithms is we need to uh, ensure that the detail condition is met so that we have a, so the detail balance condition is uh, met when we do sampling. So what happens when we um, when we are using a random walk proposal? What happens is this: uh, the the proposals are symmetric. Whether we take the forward or the reverse step, and basically this uh, Q we assume it cancels out, right? But when we are taking Langevin gradients, this does not uh, cancel out. So Hence, we need to kind of accommodate for for them. And uh, why doesn't it cancel out? So just think about is that when you are adding a random work, we are uh, drawing from the same distribution at every chain at the noise. But when we are computing the gradients, the gradients can be you know. In, in different directions and the magnitude can, of the, the gradients can be big or small at different points in time. So we need to ensure that the detail condition is met. So hence we need to take into account the, the Q ratio. And hence uh, we uh, accommodate for that using this. And uh, note that uh, the K is the current position, D is data. And in this case, what is this B and uh, the beta M? Oh, it is actually a temperature value, uh, which is used uh, in parallel tempering, which I will discuss next. But essentially the, the message here is that it is important to note that the Q ratio doesn't cancel out. And when we are uh, taking into account gradients, we need to address that. So essentially we have uh, MCMC, uh, uh, replicas, an ensemble of MCMC um, chains, and that is called parallel tempering, and which have different temperature levels of a temperature laid ladder. So those temperature uh, levels were represented here by the beta. So uh, different uh, chains or replicas will have different temperatures levels. And uh, at some point in time, you basically can, um, swipe the realization or the, the theta uh, across uh, the neighboring replicas. And that's what it's trying to show here. But in just in this figure, it is showing that it kind of considers even uh, non-neighboring replicas, but standard, it is the neighboring replicas. And we have density plots of all the different replicas. And basically at the end, what you do, you basically discard uh, the, the replicas uh, with the higher temperature and the temperature with the, the replica here starts with, let's say with the temperature one and it goes 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, all the way to two. 
so it exponentially grows uh, so what you the, the 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 replica with temperature one that is the one that has um, that is the one that has uh, that is uh, sample sampling the true posterior and it is uh, kind of assumed uh, that these uh, with the replica exchange what happens is that the realization or, or the point in space of the theta basically the information kind of flows down and comes to the temperature one and this is uh, this is uh, possible when you have like some uh, problem that is uh, you know not computationally expensive and you can run parallel tempering for hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, you know samples but in the case of neural networks where there is large neural networks and uh, problems uh, you need to uh, you need to take into account that uh, you cannot uh, just keep on sampling right you have you need to have a fixed time you know like 5000 or 10000 samples because that 5 or 10000 samples could take a few days you know so you cannot just do 100 or 200 sam thousand samples something like that it could take weeks or in for for you know uh, convolutional neural networks on a mnist it could take months so taking those things into account uh, we need to uh, use the right computing technique and hence essentially this uh, figure shows that we use interprocess communications uh, to exchange the replicas and you can run this in a parallel computing framework where each uh, process is a replica process and it can be distributed over multiple cores and uh, each of them has its own uh, neural network its own data in the whole process and basically with interprocess communication you have a replica exchange between neighboring replicas so um, we have been discussing about uh, stochastic gradient descent and so far the langevin gradients that we are using is based on the stochastic gradient descent but uh, in the in this paper we also we compare our results with uh, uh, one of the latest uh, deep learning methods, uh, which is the ADAM optimizer or adaptive moment estimation. And that is based on the idea that uh, whereas in, uh, in, in stochastic gradient descent, each parameter is updated based on a learning rate. And in adaptive moment estimation, you, you have the learning rate, which is adapted or adjusted by the first and the second moments. And uh, here you can see that the learning rate um, Adam equation shows uh, how the learning rate is uh, uh, adjusted where the beta one and uh, beta two are the two hyperparameters first where the, the beta one controls the first order momentum and beta two controls the second order momentum and is a, a scalar to prevent division by zero uh, that the idea is generally that you take a snapshot back in time and see how your uh, your theta or the weights have been updating and you are taking the first and second moments and basically your learning rate is uh, adjusted by them and whereas in the case of stochastic gradient descent your learning rate is typically fixed throughout the process so uh, basically the in this uh, paper where the citation is below uh, we did not apply to multi-step ahead prediction we were just applying to single step ahead prediction of for all these uh, uh, data sets uh, the Lorenz uh, or laser sunspot is about sunspot activity laser is about some experiments in a lab and uh, Mackey glass is uh, based on equations and Rosla is also synthetic and equation uh, based on certain equations and Henon as well and these are uh, very well known time series data sets uh, if you have some of you may have used them and uh, essentially what we see is that uh, uh, with sjd and adam uh, the the parallel tempering uh, framework with the random walk uh, is compared uh, with uh, Langevin gradients and the Langevin gradients basically the learning rate is a fixed learning rate of 0 0.1 and 0 0.01 uh, so we showed the two results and we found that uh, uh, kind of uh, the parallel tempering or 
or the Bayesian neural network that is using parallel tampering is giving very competitive results. And most of the time it beats the results of, uh, of uh, stochastic gradient descent on its own, which is doesn't have a robust uncertainty quantification. And uh, as you can see that uh, here still, uh, the random work is not so bad because the neural network size is relatively small. It's less than a hundred parameters because this is a univariate problem. Uh, then uh, you have uh, all these other pattern classification uh, data sets where we use the multinomial likelihood, I design a sphere and others. And most of them, we see that the parallel tempering with the Langevin gradients, we see uh, results that are quite similar in uh, most of the problems with the when you have the right uh, learning rate. So the learning rate is important. These are very typically very small neural networks with a few hundred uh, parameters, whereas uh, the pen digit and chess can neural networks, they are a few thousand parameters, but still, <clears throat> and uh, because they have more parameters, as you can see in the chess, the parallel, uh, the random work is uh, struggling. Where and also here in the pen digit and the bank, whereas the Langevin gradients they perform better. So it gradients is uh, important. And uh, as far as uh, the time is concerned, we note that still um, uh, with the Langevin gradients, the time is a bit higher when you compare it to. Um, uh, to random work because you computationally and computation time is taken to compute the gradients. So uh, moving on, um, I think I mentioned most of these things. And in this paper, we also see that it's uh, the sampling is highly sensitive to the Langevin gradient learning. Can we tailor it to the type of the problem? And that's a problem actually. So. In the future research, we do use other things. Uh, we use Adam actually. So I'll talk about that next uh, after this one. So uh, talking about computational problems, we know that uh, we have uh, these problems that we have used uh, shown, they are actually uh, relatively small problems, but there can be larger problems or larger neural network structures or models that can be very computationally expensive, such as in geoscientific models. So uh, surrogate assisted or surrogate based MCMC parallel tempering framework we proposed uh, last uh, the year before. And uh, basically this is to address uh, much uh, complex multinomial, multimodal posterior distribution and computational complexity. And uh, with the parallel tempering, we can say that uh, it, because it's, it's quite uh, flexible, you can use parallel computing with parallel tempering and it uh, reduces the computation time. But then still uh, for large networks, we still have those problems when you have larger data sets, which we didn't really account for. So surrogate assisted optimization is a field where you have optimization algorithms and then you have um, you have models that are too computationally expensive uh, to evaluate. So you build a surrogate model using like a Gaussian process or a neural network is your surrogate, which tries to understand the model or from the realizations of the model and it tries to mimic that model over time. And what happens is that sometimes you, you evaluate from the actual model and sometimes you evaluate from the surrogate. The surrogate can be like, milliseconds in evaluation and the actual model can be minutes or hours, you know? So, uh, so I was thinking that, shall we try to bring that surrogate assisted optimization? Uh, I was motivated by those. I, we developed this framework where we brought in those, that knowledge from the surrogate assisted framework. And then we developed a parallel computing framework in a M uh, using MCMC to do some Bayesian inference uh, work. And uh, first we developed this using neural network models. And then later we applied this to geoscientific problems. So uh, we have um, 
this is uh, just a framework of the of a parallel tempering framework where you have different replicas and your sampling is operating occurring and then in the samples you have basically the history of the samples that means the you have the history of the weights or the theta and then you have the history of the likelihood and basically we need to combine all that into and then add that data together and then we train a model surrogate model and this is let's say if if there are 10000 samples we do it this i at every at some interval you know like at every five interval of every 500 samples you do this process and your surrogate model is updated at every interval and uh, then uh, there's a uh, interprocess communication your uh, you have a main process you have your surrogate model that is uh, updated at every interval and then we have all the different replicas have a local surrogate model. Our, our goal was to not train, in this framework, we do not train uh, the surrogate model in the local surrogate uh, models, but we just train in the global surrogate models. And then we take the weights of that global surrogate model, that means which has the knowledge, and then we transfer it into the local surrogate and uh, basically then at times you sample from the actual likelihood and then at times you sample from the surrogate likelihood or the pseudo likelihood so that's basically the framework uh, going back and uh, we actually have phi and uh, here we put the theta uh, uh, with the phi and uh, uh, lambda and basically we have the realizations the x axis here are basically the history of the samples the theta and they are all combined with the likelihoods and they are all combined and basically these equations basically show this so uh it's a bit comp it looks a bit complicated. I wish I could say that if you study the paper and the code, it will become easier. But uh, this uh, project was not that straightforward. It, it was one of my most challenging projects. And uh, the reason is because when you are dealing with parallel computing, then you are inviting trouble in your life. And uh, this, hence, it was very challenging for us. and. Uh, I worked with uh, a number of interns from India who traveled and helped me as well at, during those days. And uh, I'm very thankful to them. And we all uh, basically developed a Python framework where we have the surrogate model trained in the main process and it's, the model is transferred to the local process. Uh, and uh, the thing is that for deep neural networks, this may not be used that much, but we just wanted to kind of demonstrate a proof of concept first with uh, simple neural networks, and then in later research, it could be applied to deep neural networks. So the challenge here is that your surrogate uh, model at every different, each different likelihood should try to somewhat resemble your true likelihood. So here is a figure that shows for the iris uh, problem the uh, yes we are dealing with log likelihood um, it's trying very hard to resemble and towards the end then it becomes quite good actually in the beginning it's difficult so as as more data is captured over time your surrogate model becomes better and better and this is over time which is in number of samples and for iris and cancer problems, and these problems, they have less number of parameters. Uh, just uh, knowing, no, noting that those parameters are all fed, like you, if you have 200 parameters, then your surrogate model will have 200 inputs, right? But if you have a deep neural network with 
10,000 parameters, then you will have 10,000 inputs, then this, that doesn't make sense because your surrogate model becomes more expensive to train. So in that type of case, you can you know, sample your uh, weight space or your parameter space. So from 10,000, you can take the mean and standard deviation of certain blocks of fe features or uh, parameters. And then, you know, you can have a hundred or a few hundred uh, inputs to your uh, surrogate model. So um, this was applied to, um, to all these problems, the similar problems from the previous papers, and you can see. So the, the challenge here is that at the end of the day, what we want is that you have a framework that gives you model uh, model where your accuracy training and test accuracy is similar to a framework that does not have surrogates. So you can see that in most cases here, our training and test accuracy is, is similar. And then you want your elapsed time to be reduced, essentially. Here, you can see the elapsed time is similar or actually even greater. And that can happen because your actual uh, model or data in neural network is very small. So these were the things just to demonstrate the proof of concept, but the, the bigger data set, bank, pen digit, and the chest, these are the data sets with few thousand parameters and uh, you know, uh, 10 or 15,000 instances in the data. So those you can see that the time has been significantly reduced from 86 minutes to 65 minutes of one, uh, uh, run, you know. Uh, so here you can see that the reduction of time is greater. So uh, what is there in these brackets? Actually, that is the surrogate probability. Like, how often do you want to use the surrogate model in a particular time interval of sample? So uh, twenty-five. That means. Um, uh, and then you have a surrogate 50, a probability of 25% and 50%, something like that. And basically that determines, uh, you know, you see the computational time is reduced and then the results are similar. So um, in some cases we saw even that uh, the results are kind of improved a little bit and uh, the Langevin gradients do increase and uh, improves the accuracy of the results. And uh, in future way work, we applied this to geoscientific models. I don't have time to discuss this work, but the same framework is used for landscape evolution model, where we look at millions of years of past of Earth's geological or uh, topographic uh, history. And uh, the model basically simulates how the mountains basically eroded, eroded and formed sediments, for example, and things like that. And that paper is uh, cited below here. And uh, then now with this uh, moving to the stuff that we've been doing from last year is mostly applying the same because now our framework has been developed and we need to apply to deep learning models. And the first deep learning model is an autoencoder. What are autoencoders? They have the ability to compress data. They are prominent deep learning methods and they need a robust uncertainty quantification because when you compress data, you need to ensure that information is not lost. And uh, with the motivation of our previous work, we applied that. And uh, uh, we got some interesting results. And uh, basically these, uh, these basically give uh, equations, give the framework for uh, autoencoder. I think when we see the autoencoder pictorially, it makes more sense. So you have uh, your, so your data, you, we don't need to worry if the data, autoencoders are used are unsupervised learning methods. So we do not need to label the data. So you're looking only at features. So the input layer basically takes, you take your features and then you have this hierarchical, you know, structure in your neural network and then you have a reduced representation. So for example, you have 10 input neurons or 10 features and they are reduced to two features, and then they are reconstructed back to the original. And the original output layer, uh, the output and the input is compared, and that's where you kind of compute your 
uh, score, uh, which is um, your loss. And actually the goal is that you optimize your neural network. So the argument of a phi and uh, this uh, symbol there, they both uh, are reduced. So which is this and the, the encoder and the decoder, okay? So I'm running a bit out of time, uh, moving on. And basically we applied that to, uh, so we replaced that simple neural network by this out, deep auto encoders and, and used, so it's a parallel computing framework where the pink ones, uh, basically they show that the processes are running in parallel, okay? Um, and we used some uh, common data sets and basically, this is the input, the, the, the architecture of the neural network. And you can see that for the Medellon data set, there are, are uh, a million parameters. Is it? Yes, it's a million parameters. And then you have 27,000, 21,000. And uh, for the same problem, we have two different architectures for the Swiss roll problem, which is a very simple problem. And whereas Medellon, we have 500 features in the data set and we are trying to compress it to 300 features, it seems here. While we have uh, 85 features and we're compressing to 50 features. And whereas Swiss roll, we have three features and we're com compressing to two features. So this is the Swiss roll data set and this is the original. Uh, and basically it's, uh, it's a synthetic data set uh, to see how the you know role is uh, formed and how it can be separated. Um, so with canonical autoencoder, this is what we get, and with Bayesian encode uh, autoencoder, this is what we get. And you can see the colors are more separated. Our goal is to actually the Bayesian encoder to have similar effect as the canonical autoencoder, and uh, we are uh, first. To do all this uh, work with the MCMC, note that we need to have the right proposal distribution, the right, you know, um, step size of, uh, and the right learning rate in the stochastic gradient descent and stuff. And then we found that, and we compared with the Swiss roll, uh, the star basically shows the reduced representation, and where we find that uh, if there's not enough parameters, we have very small accepted percentage acceptant in the MCMC samples. So uh, here we can see that uh, the canonical autoencoder is JD versus Adam. Uh, and then we have the Bayesian autoencoder is JD versus Adam. So in the Langevin gradient, this time we used Adam gradients, the Adam that I discussed earlier, which has a, a, a different uh, style of uh, updates where it uses adaptive learning rate. So here you can see that Adam does much better work than the uh, Langevin, uh, sorry, than the SJD. And the first two are, there's no Bayesian framework. It's just using gradient based methods. And you can see that the, the you know, for all the three data sets, Adam works better. And, and then we do implement our MCMC parallel tempering framework with both Adam and SJD. And here we can see that the Adam is doing much better work. And then how does it compare to uh, uh, recent work? Uh, so we, uh, the thing is that you take the re reduced representation and then you can use something like a KNN, K nearest to neighbors, naive bias, SVM and things like that and then see how well now you can do classification or any other tasks. And we compared our results to those in the literature and we can see that our results compare quite well with the, the same methods basically. And essentially this is, these are some examples of the posterior distribution of selected parameters for each of those problem, Medellon, COIL 2000 and Swiss law. And uh, you can see at times there's multimodality in the posterior distribution, and this is very common. Okay, those are conclusions, and these results do motivate further work in other types of uh, deep learning neural networks, uh, GANs, and we have used this uh, approach for Bayesian graph neural networks. So, uh, so far, what we have been looking at is structured data. 
data that is well organized and we can do pre-processing and develop a nice uh, deep learning or the simple uh, neural network models. But uh, the, uh, the, the fact out there is that all data out there is not organized. There's a lot of unstructured data. And this is includes in areas of health, medicine, social networks, and research data repositories. And data, these data sets, they are kind of can be represented as graphs. And uh, convolutional neural networks have gained a lot of attention and you can use grave graph based data representation in con with convolutional neural networks and convolutional neural networks are very deep learning deep architectures that are typically used for multimedia applications for computer vision and so on and these networks they have like millions of parameters one particular trained uh, pre-trained uh, convolutional neural network is known as the LX network for example that has millions of parameters um, so the same motivation we use the same infrastructure that we have developed and we try to develop a base GC and base graph conversional neural networks for graph some graph problems so this is a, a a graph a structure showing molecule interactions and that graph is basically uh, placed together as a as a tree here you can see that this uh, red is connected to all these three uh, four green circles there so uh, um, and what is a graph neural network actually a graph neural network uh, as we see that the graph uh, data structure consists of a set of vertices V and edges E. They can be either directed or in, undirected. Each node represents data element and the edges denote the relationship between the data elements. So for example, a graph is uh, your social network, LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, and the nodes are the people and the edges are basically the links to other people. And there are things like uh, the edges can denote things like number of likes to other people's profiles and things like that, or number of comments. Each node has its own graph embedding via a feature vector, which summarizes the properties of the particular data element. And these nodes basically say, use the graph embedding to the immediate neighbor in the form of messages. A visual will always help. And so you have your graph data, and then you have your graph neural network, and this data needs to be transformed into a, into a way so that your neural network takes that as an input. And that uh, transformation is called embedding and uh, graph embedding, and there are a number of ways to do graph embedding. And uh, essentially, uh, you need uh, uh, so the message receiver node V at time T and M is constructed over aggregating a set of uh, neighboring vectors. So basically you need to for, 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 uh, develop an embedding vector. Embedding vector is where you basically, you take uh, consider these different nodes and you take into a, a account how they are linked to the other nodes and things like that. And essentially there are algorithms from which we develop an embedding vector and then you uh, transform, uh, then you feed that into your neural network and your neural network uh, computation slightly changed due to this message uh, passing where you take average message from different neighbors of the neural network. Actually, this is your target node and these all these uh, nodes are input and they are shared I and uh, C, for example, that uh, is connected uh, to uh, B, and that that thing is I C um, and B is there, and uh, that's connected, and basically uh, that shared weight basically represents them via the embedding and the. The goal is to train your neural network and you can use standard gradient based methods such as Adam and others to train it. And this is an example of a PubMed citation graph data set where you have uh, different, uh, you know, categories of papers uh, and they are your nodes.
and uh, there are a number of graph problems and uh, essentially for graph classification you you, you you one problem is you classify different types of graphs then you have node classification what are the types of nodes so basically you take a data set or cases and then you it will tell what node that it belongs to and basically our problem that we'll discuss next is node classification others are link prediction what are the links or uh, edges and community of graphs uh, more sort of uh, clustering type of uh, issue there and the embedding is what we were talking about uh, basically you how the graph is kind of uh, you need embedding and after this with this embedding then you use it in a neural network to do node classification for example and then also graph generation it could be you generating some uh, new data sets so uh, essentially you have input uh, graph signal and then you get a word vector and then from that essentially you have convolutional uh, layers which uh, go into max pooling layers and then fully connected layer uh, this is a convolutional neural network with graphs but uh, i think this is a better visualization in terms of convolutional neural networks where you have uh, max pooling layers with some activation function and these uh, layers uh, can be a couple to, uh, to several layers where the information is transformed and it keeps on going at the end where you need to make certain decisions actually. So uh, those uh, to, uh, the, the PubMed and there's another Quora data set so this is also a graph and it is also about uh, papers and citations and a similar algorithm and how did we perform in these data sets basically the Quora cites here PubMed these are the number of nodes and the problem is node classification so number of classes we need to classify but uh, as you can see the number in the training set is uh, not very large and testing there's a large uh, number for testing. Uh, in each of those uh, data sets, we develop our convolutional graph neural network uh, with the different uh, number of uh, max pooling and other layers as uh, uh, layers. And uh, we can see that the sites here data set has 59,000 parameters and then we have 23,000 and PubMed is a smaller data set. So you have a smaller neural network architecture essentially we uh, did mcmc sampling with the parallel tempering framework we used uh, both uh, adam and sjd for the langevin gradients and we found that uh, our results we have some sort of convergence where our results are quite comparable to those in the literature uh, as you can see this the best is 75 but we get 79 percent in the case of Quora, and in here the best is uh, 64, and in this case with Adam 70, but we can with Adam here get around 70. So here the best is 77 and 79 mean, and we get 79 and 77.50 with Adam, and with Adam we get better results, and with SJD basically. Uh, we found that we couldn't train these graph neural networks. Uh, so um, the other thing is uh, the Bayes JD because the canonical one we couldn't do it well, and the Bayesian version also we we could just get a little bit better from the canonical method. Whereas uh, the one with um, so the one with SPIC is basically looking at canonical methods and. Uh, our goal is to essentially have a Bayesian inference framework so that we have similar results compared to the literature, but our results have robust uncertainty quantification. And this is just an example of some parameter values for the posterior. And this is uh, showing how the Quora sites here from my data set, how we converged. And we can see that uh, just in the first, uh, for example, um, 500 uh, samples we kind of go to we kind of achieve kind of good likelihood values um, and somewhat quite good classification uh, accuracies 
which kind of we stay around there. So it's kind of, we can assume it's converged. We did some convergence diagnosis, gelman rubin diagnosis, and those results are actually shown in the paper. And generally, I have uh, discussed these conclusions already. And what is left is to apply this framework to some real world problems. Uh, so this is most of what uh, all the new, uh, all the stuff that I've been doing. And the future research direction is applying uh, Bayesian deep learning for language models. So, and I have been doing uh, more research in language models from end of last year and stuff like, you know, looking at how people are expressing themselves in Twitter during COVID-19. And that's a uh, paper I have uh, uploaded in archive and it's available in my Google Scholar profile if you want to see. So we saw that, for example, as the cases raised in India, what type of uh, tweets people were making all around the world and particularly in India for particular months as the peak was reached. A lot of people were essentially joking in Twitter and but uh, joking and being very optimistic as well. That's what we found. Uh, but anyway, so those types of problems, we would like to have a Bayesian deep learning framework for those type of problems to have better uncertainty quantification. And transformers are more sophisticated LSTM models and LSTM models, wrong short-term memory models, which is a type of deep learning model. And we are uh, going to look at that next with uh, Professor Scott Sisson and um, uh, Ishwar Nikula who's in India. And uh, with Scott again, with the language models, with Ayush Bhagat, uh, who's an intern, we are looking at uh, applying that whole framework. And then uh, also Bayesian deep learning for few short learning. Few short learning is when you have uh, problems where you do not have enough data samples and you want to use some type of generation of data or somehow ensure and uh, uh, that, that you have better performance by generating data somehow or applying some tricks, but that is in incomplete data sets. So you make a lot of assumption, but I see a lot of scope for using Bayesian inference and MCMC methods in that area. And uh, combining all those things together, we have uh, upcoming, it's in a planning stage. We haven't started the work. Uh, it's called Pingala, which will be a Bayesian deep learning library uh, based uh, on ancient Indian mathematician Pingala, who uh, actually introduced a binary number system to the world. So his name is kind of forgotten. We all use binary number system and hence our deep learning framework will be named after him. Uh, hopefully we get this out uh, end of this year or next year. So uh, the, the first one, this is basically the framework for base LSTM for transformers and language models. And essentially we have some data, uh, sentiment analysis data, sentiments or emotions. And you want to say like where people are expressing themselves, what type of emotions they are expressing in Twitter. And then we need to quantify uncertainty in how the model actually predicts them. And this is basically the inner working of a deep learning LSTM model, which takes in information and is essentially a recurrent neural network with things there. And this is this part is supposed to be part of the framework here, actually. So that's basically the talk, and I've kind of almost exceeded the time. Uh, and um, more information is there, and I would like to. Uh, in my profile, GitHub repo and places. And I would like to thank all the people who are co-authors in the last four papers, Professor Sally Cripps, Ratanil Deo, Arpit Kapoor, Konak Jain, Ashray Aman, Mahavendra Maharana, Ayush Bhagat, Mahir Jain, and Pavel uh, Kripsky. And Pavel is a senior lecturer at UNSW. Some of you may know him. And with uh, Pavel and Scott Sisson, I'm getting more into the deep learning area. And I'm looking forward to actually collaborate with both of you groups from your groups from University of Auckland and Waikato. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there was a lot. <laughs> I think you can really give, give an overview for all the uh, deep learning methods. Um, I think we might have uh, one or two questions. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, hi. Um, when you're doing like a uh, mini batching, how do you deal with the problem of estimating the log likelihood and its gradients of the entire data set using only a subsample? Um, uh, we are based, our Langevin gradient paper is based on uh, Max Welling, uh, Professor Max Welling's paper, where he, uh, which came out on NIPS in 2011. And uh, essentially your question is asking uh, about the mini batch stochastic gradient descent, is it? Yes, how do you estimate, because in your MCMC you need the log likelihood, right? Yeah. So how do you estimate that of the log likelihood of the whole data set when you're only like putting in mini batches? No, so we don't do, we don't uh, take the whole data set. We just do it for the low, the log likelihood takes into account only the batch basically when we are doing considering the mini batches but okay. in, in these cases so the stochastic gradient the stochastic gradient descent actually so in the data sets that i have shown uh, mostly those data sets we do not implement the mini batch stochastic gradient descent we implemented the one where we were using the whole training data as a batch, right? So, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Right, so, but in the case of uh, these other problems that we are doing, uh, uh, so we did some work with convolutional neural networks and we used the MNIST data set. And in there, basically, we were using the mini batch. And in there, basically, you assume that your batch is your data for a sample. So your sample, uh, in one sample, you do not take the whole data, you take a batch, but then you could do like a number of batches. So basically you can think of it as subsampling in a way as well. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, I um, I just had a question. So, in terms of robust uncertainty quantification, what's what's the advantage of using this tempering MCMC versus, say, um, ensembling or Monte Carlo dropout, which I think were introduced by Yaron Gal in his in his PhD thesis in 2016. So, um, for for uncertainty quantification. Yeah. So uh, the thing about the dropout, that paper became a bit popular, but uh, I think uh, I've been talking to statisticians. I'm a computer science, I have a computer science background, by the way, but uh, recently I have been converted as a Bayesian. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, the thing is, like, uh, I've been talking to people, and uh, basically, that uh, dropouts, you could see, see it as uh, an approximation, approximate method, whereas here we are sampling from the true prosteria distribution. So you have variational inference methods, which are seen as approximate methods. But then that paper, the dropouts paper, it actually is yet to be accepted in the Bayesian community. And I think uh, since you guys are in this area, uh, you should be critiquing that paper and trying to see uh, and evaluate it actually. Do you accept that methodology as a rigorous form of uncertainty quantification? Because MCMC methods sample from the true posterior distribution, whereas, and the other thing is, does it, I, I, I'm not sure how there's no, I mean, how Bayes theorem is actually implemented in that paper. Uh, it's not very clear, you know? So it's not very clear how the priors are there, how they are accommod accommodated, uh, or, uh, and then it's not very clear the, about the likelihood. It's uh, basically dropping uh, some weights and taking averages. It's, uh, it does quantify uncertainty to some level, but is it rigorous? That's an open question. And I don't think it is rigorous. Uh, this is based on uh, many statisticians I've been talking to. Okay, thanks. That's useful, useful commentary. Yeah.
Um, also, I just wanted to say thanks, um, Dutch, for a great talk, and thanks, Kate, for letting us, letting us join. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, working with you all. Well, thank you very much because we are a bit over time. <clears throat> thank you very much for a wonderful talk, and I hope to visit us near near future. And thanks for giving us talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.